Hi, I'm Ed Jaffe and welcome back to JaffeWoodwinds.com. Today we start our fifth season of video interviews with great woodwind artists. Uh, when we began the Woodwind Legacy series five years ago, uh, it was my hope to gather uh, woodwind players, saxophonists, clarinetists, flutists, conductors, arrangers, composers, contractors, uh, to get a full sense of what the music industry today offers for woodwind players and others as well. And we've been very lucky uh, to have so many great artists. And today we're joined by the esteemed first flute player of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Jeffrey Kaner. Jeffrey, thanks so much for being here, and I appreciate you coming over after a full day of teaching at Juilliard and <laughs> spending a little time with us. Uh, I'm sure you're pretty exhausted, but... It's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, thanks. Um, I wanted to give our listeners a little bit of a background uh, as to your beginnings, because uh, by the time you were 23, you were appointed principal flute of the Cleveland Orchestra, succeeding the great uh, Maurice Sharp. Uh, it's an astonishing thing to think of a 23-year-old coming in to an orchestra of the stature of Cleveland um, and, and gaining that job. But it's even more astonishing to realize that you actually began flute, I believe, in seventh grade or somewhere yeah. in that area. I started in seventh grade um, in Montreal, where I'm from. Right. Uh, high school started in seventh grade, and that's where band started. We did not have band before that. Right. So uh, that's basically what happened. The first day of uh, band class, the teacher asked us to choose an instrument, and um, I wanted the flute, and I uh, contrived to stay behind uh, until after everyone had left the room so I could put my request on top so I would get it. <laughs> Very smart. <laughs> but I don't actually even remember why I did that. All I remember is that that's the instrument that I wanted and I really wasn't interested in anything else. So fortunately I got it and, uh, and that's basically how I began. After that, it never really occurred to me to do anything else. Right. Once I started working on it, so I So you, you would have been it. roughly around 13 years old at that time. Seventh grade is roughly... So almost 10 years of playing and you're a principal in the Cleveland Orchestra. That, I mean, that's really astonishing to think about beginning an instrument and 10 years later you have achieved a, a level of world-class playing to be appointed to that prestigious position. So obviously you're a very talented fellow, uh, but what transpired in those 10 years to bring you to that level of achievement and success? It's funny, I have never actually thought of it in those terms, that it was 10 years. Um, that's interesting. Uh, but, you know, I was extremely lucky. That plays a huge part in the careers of anyone who has great success. Um, but it's important to remember that the luck is, is what you get. Uh, it's, it's over things that you have no control. Uh, so it, it was lucky that Mo Sharp decided to retire at that time, for example. Um, but then I had worked very hard and I was able to take advantage of that luck. Right. Um, but know. during those 10 years of study, uh, obviously you must have begun study with some teacher, a flute teacher early on. Yeah. And can we talk about th those teachers who played such an important part in your development? Well, my very first teacher was uh, a friend of my older brother's uh, who played the flute. Her name was, is Carolyn Christie. And she ultimately became the second flute of the Montreal Symphony. But at that time, she was a student uh, at um, McGill University, where my brother was also a student. And I started to study with her. Um, I was her first pupil, in fact. So um, she was studying with Jean Backstresser. Uh -huh. who um, very quickly became my idol. Right. And um, I started working then with, uh, with Jeannie Backstresser. Was Jean a principal in Montreal at that time? Yes. And before she went to Toronto? That's correct. Okay. 
so I uh, worked with, uh, with Jeannie Baxter. So I finished high school at grade 11 and I went to McGill University for one year uh, when I was uh, 16. And I studied with her that year. And then when I was 17, I came to New York to study with her teacher, Julius Baker. Right. Right, and so you were with Julie for the next four or five years prior to uh, four years. Four yeah. years, yeah. So uh, you've had you had wonderful teachers, top I had level place. Yes, the very and you best. had a chance to also one of the important things I think when youngsters are studying, and importantly to study the instrument that you're working on with someone who plays that instrument. But then you also had the advantage of hearing oh, really high level players of that instrument right off the bat. Uh, that aside, <laughs> you must have worked very hard, uh, and uh, you know because yes, you can become a great player over a period of time. But to, again, to gain that position in the Cleveland Orchestra, you had to have more than just good teachers and hard work. That obviously you had a great uh, talent, and you uh, optimized it. Well, um, yeah, I. Uh, I'll tell you, I, um, birthdays are not, have never been very important to me um, since my 20th. And that one was somewhat traumatic uh, because I realized uh, that I was 20 years old, I was no longer a teenager, and it dawned on me that I'd never done anything that teenagers were supposed to do. I didn't. Uh, I didn't party. I didn't drink beer. You didn't drink beer. I didn't drink beer. You can't. Li I'm, you can't work today in the United States. <laughs> well, maybe I can't be on the Supreme Court. That's we'll right. See. But uh, I, I worked very hard. I, I practiced. I, I spent a lot of time alone, in a practice room, and uh, so twenty was 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 a little traumatic. Uh, but since then, age has has only been a number. Uh, maybe. I got it out of me uh, that year. So I missed out on, on that. Maybe I made up for it some since, in my 20s perhaps. Um, but I had a really good basis of um, discipline built in because of that work that I did when I was in my teens. Right, and I know from having attended uh, Gene Backstress or master classes and having seen Gene teach a uh, close up, uh, She's fantastic, and she's very disciplined, very organized, very clear. Uh, and also, then you had Jean with then Julie. Uh, I mean, you're coming from a similar sound palette uh, and an approach. Since Jean also, you know, idolized uh, Baker, as so many of us have. Uh, so I mean, it, it would seem to be that everything sort of lined up. The stars were aligned correctly. Exactly. In that way. I was lucky. Yeah. Well, yeah. it it. it yeah, there's always luck, like you said, but still, that hard work, the talent, all came uh, and settled nicely. Now, uh, you were uh, obviously somewhat of a prodigy in order to achieve all this at a young age. And, and, but today, the young flute players who we see as prodigies are eight, nine, ten years old. Yes. And you, now being uh, the flute professor at both Juilliard and at the Curtis Institute, are probably one of the people who meet most of these young people and have direct contact with them on a weekly basis. What have you seen over the years is the change, one, in the type of people who are achieving a high level of flute playing at these conservatories and, and the levels of playing? I mean, have you seen a dramatic change even over the last 30 years? Absolutely. Uh, the level, the, uh, the, the technical ability of students now is extraordinary. Uh, I'm talking about the very highest echelon of students, those right. who might be called prodigies. Uh, it's absolutely extraordinary, uh, the, the technical ability that they have. Um, and, you know, and, and what do you attribute that to? I mean, is it, is it just the pedagogy has gotten better, the instruments ergonomically maybe are a little more friendly? or? Or is it just the popularity of the instrument has spread now and YouTube has made it easy for everyone to hear something so easily? Um, well, those things, but primarily it is simply that once one person does it, then all of a sudden other people can do it. So when a, a young kid hears another young kid playing 
you know, the Berio Sequenza, right. then all of a sudden, oh, I got to do that too. <laughs> That's right. And they know they can, right. somebody else can. And there's nothing more stimulating, more uh, encouraging than to know that it, it right. is possible. Right. Know, that's what gives them the impetus, I think. Right. To... I remember when I auditioned for the Masters of Juilliard as a saxophone player, they were, uh, and, and I was studying flute very seriously at the time. I remember the Dutio Sonatine was considered, you know, a, a fine entry level piece for the flutist to play at the audition. Now it's a high school, uh, you know, it's oh, high yeah. school competition piece. Yeah, it's, it's astonishing. Well, uh, you know, the Ebert Concerto, when it was written, was right. considered unplayable. The standard, right. And now that's, uh, I mean, I have students who are not even double digit age yet who play it no. flawlessly. Uh, are you, are you, you, wait, let me, let me translate that so I get this. You're telling me eight and nine year olds yes. can play this? Mm -hmm. Why am I suddenly feeling old? <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just a, a different... I mean, violinists went through this... Um, Menuhin, I guess, is decades the great... Decades ago. Right, the Menuhin example yeah. of like a fully developed almost uh, artist at 11, yeah. you know, but I... I well, you know, the Tchaikovsky concerto was considered... Uh, unplayable. Uh, virtually right. unplayable yeah, when it yeah. was first written. Yeah. Now, kids play that. Yeah, I... I Still, as a, with a wind instrument, still having the control of the airstream and at such a young age to be able to execute long phrases such as the Iber with extreme register change, that's it's still a little mind-blowing. Yeah. It's hard to imagine. Um, getting back to your development, uh, you mentioned the great teachers you've had, uh, how hard you worked. Who were the flutists you were listening to at that time, whether in, on recordings or in live performance, do you remember being influenced by any other flutists other than uh, Jeannie Backstress or Julie Baker? Uh, well, I used to listen to lots of recordings. Um, uh, I um, there were many flutists that I admired. There were few that I wanted to emulate, um, and I was so focused on the style of playing that was, um, if you will, the, uh, you know, that, that Baker and, and Backstresser, they both epitomized a certain style of playing, which for me was, was the ideal. And uh, so there were many other um, uh, great flute players. Um, typically they weren't, they didn't have the same sort of philosophy of playing or of, of sound production. Right. And, and so I, that's really what I wanted. I, and so I did not, as a student, run around and do master classes with other people. Huh. I did not search out other teachers because I wasn't really that interested at that age. Right. Uh, I whether, was so focused on what I wanted myself. And, and were there specific recordings that you tended to gravitate to that you played over and over again or that you came back to at various points? Or was it just the general uh, overview that you took at that time? Uh, no, I think it was a general a general sort of appreciation for a way of playing and a way of thinking right. when one plays that was so important to me. Um, recordings are funny things, you know. You, uh, I have memories of thinking certain recordings were absolutely fantastic. Maybe orchestral recordings, for example. Uh, uh, there was a recording that I loved of uh, the Saint-Saëns Third Symphony when I was a teenager, I just thought it was fantastic. And now I listen to it, I wonder, what was I thinking? You know, it's like, did I not notice that it's not quite as good as I thought it was? Yeah. Um, well, it changes as we get older. Everything things changes. Things change. Perspectives, yeah. 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 And do, today, with all of the students that you teach, both at Juilliard and at Curtis, do you reference them? Uh, do you reference for them any recordings to, to check out or, or other players to listen to? Uh, I've seldom uh, reference specific recordings and I, I over and over again caution against listening to recordings, especially YouTube uh, recordings of performers who should not be well, referenced as great examples of a piece, you know, because everyone can put up a recording now on YouTube. Right. Everyone does. And right. that doesn't mean that it should be used as, an, as a good example. Right. And students now are so used to just going on there and 
putting in the piece they want and, and listening yeah. to those recordings. And one cannot help but be influenced. And sometimes that's really not a good thing. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I know for myself, there are whatever my instrument, I'm either saxophone, clarinet, or flute, there are very sp specific players, and even for specific pieces that I tend to gravitate to, uh, to reorient myself in thinking. So um, if you have a student who's is looking for some inspiration or is a little down or something, is there any time you say, well, maybe listen to this recording whether it be a flute player or not, or this a symph this symphony, uh, I don't with recall this ever having done that. Okay. You know, I, I think we our responsibility as performers is to take our inspiration from the composer. And uh, yes, it frequently happens where a student has no clue what to do with a piece. So what we try to do is to understand what the composer is looking for here. Um, sometimes it's just so simple as to is to make a student figure out what's the most important note in a phrase you know because sometimes we don't know where to even start and that's a really good place to start is to figure out okay there's got to be one note in this phrase that's more important than all the others you know the note that you're leading to or the note you're coming away from just figure out what that one note is and that's a, a very good exercise uh, for students to be able to identify that and to become excited about figuring out what the music actually means. You know, music is like language. Every right. phrase is trying to say something in a manner of speaking. Right. And it's much more important that the student go searching for that themselves from the music rather than hearing recordings. I, I right. actually do not encourage students to listen to recordings right. until they're old enough to understand what's good about a recording and what is not so good. Right. And in, in the process of guiding the students through a piece, through an etude, uh, whatever it might be, do you, uh, many teachers would often mark in specific, I mean, they'd mark the whole thing up and uh, dictate the whole piece, or do you let them sort of find it for themselves? I mean, there, there are different approaches to how people have taught. I remember when I interviewed Paul Dunkel, uh, he, he was talking about his studies uh, with William Kincaid. Uh, Paul was one of Kincaid's last students, and Kincaid would come here after he had left the Philly Orchestra. He would come here to, and take a room in a hotel, uh, maybe on a Saturday, and students would come, and he would teach them. But I remember Paul saying, I think it was a Bach sonata that he was working through, maybe the B minor, and Kincaid would, mark, before he even played, he'd mark the entire movement up with all of the markings he wanted him to do, and, and then, you'd have, you know, be able to reproduce that. Huh. So I don't sense that you would do no. that. <laughs> no. So you, do you let each no. student sort of find that, that aspect? No. Um, I mean, to use Bach as an example, it's a perfect example because I encourage students to, uh, when working on the Bach sonatas, to remove everything that's in any edition that's out there. So remove all slurs in the fast movement, all dynamics, huh. get rid of all of that, and then start working on it from just the notes. And then to start thinking about where you would add slurs, where you would add dynamics, what you want to do, but more importantly, why you would want to do that. That's what the music is, and that's what it's important for the student to understand, is how to develop an interpretation, getting it directly from the composer. So I discourage as much as I possibly can <laughs> editions um, of, of any music, um, really, but mostly of uh, you know, Baroque music or um, Mozart concertos or French conservatory pieces. The editions are usually really awful and, and can lead to really compromised results. And, and so often it's difficult for a student to distinguish the difference between what the composer wanted and what the editor has put in. Right. And that's actually a, a constant struggle is to um, uh, eliminate all of the editor's markings so right. that the student will develop their own interpretation. Right, right. Just shifting gears a little bit back to your uh, uh, career. Um, 
after you left Cleveland, you moved, I think, in 1990 into the principal position uh, in Philadelphia, where you succeeded Murray Panitz. Uh, and going from Cleveland to Philadelphia, you're dealing with two very different halls, different styles of playing in the orchestra, uh, conductors uh, very different at the time, certainly. Uh, how did, what changes uh, did you find yourself making or needing to make based on playing in the different orchestras and also playing in very different style of halls? Um, yeah, when I moved from Cleveland to Philadelphia, uh, the difference in halls was extraordinary. Uh, and Cle Philadelphia was still in the Academy of Music uh, yes. at that time. So that, that's why I say at that time. Right. Uh, because we played at the Academy of Music. Um, Severance Hall in Cleveland was a very small, intimate, and extremely good flute hall. It was very easy to play there. The flute sounded terrific. You got, you got feedback when oh, you were playing from the whole... It was, it was a lovely hall to play in. Yeah. And I think it's even better now uh, when they, they renovated, they restored it, and I think it's even better now than it was when I was there. I, I came to the Academy of Music, it was, oh my God. <laughs> um, the Academy was huge, it seemed at that time to me huge, and very dry. Uh, it felt like playing into a wet blanket. And so I did not actually specifically think in terms of, okay, what do I need to do in order to change, to work with this hall? But it was a struggle to learn how to be comfortable playing there. And uh, I can confess, it was never really comfortable um, playing there. The hall that we play in now at the Kimmel Center is much more comfortable in in that respect um but the hall we're in now is is enormous the volume is enormous so right. going back to the academy the academy seems small well compared to this yeah. uh, huh. because uh, our hall now is 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 very high very wide very deep so it seems like a huge space um and i typically prefer smaller more intimate halls more uh, if for lack of a better term, human scale halls, uh, which are better, I think, for acoustical music. Right. Did you go through any changes in equipment uh, during this transition from Cleveland to Philadelphia, and even in Philadelphia from the Academy to Verizon Hall? No. Um, I I'm very unneurotic about equipment. Can you teach me how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a lifelong struggle. <laughs> you know, I... Um, my tendency, if something doesn't feel good, is to always assume that it's me and not the instrument. And so I, I usually try to play through things and, and to get my flute to work. I don't change instruments for repertoire or for... I, I have a good instrument, a really good, really fine Yamaha um, flute, which right. is built to my own scale. And, I, and, I, and can you tell us what that model is? The, well, it's a it's it's a 440 scale, so right. it's a a number that has my initials after it, in order to indicate that it's my own scale. Right. And there are some sort of design differences with the placement of keys and and. And were there actually did you actually change relocation of tone holes yes. to accommodate yes. that? Okay. Yes. Uh, so it's an extremely comfortable scale for me to play on, and uh, and uh, many people have are also using that model and uh, apparently find the same result with, with right. that scale. And, and you have a head joint also that you've designed with the Yamaha folks, I think the K yes, model, right? the K model. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't switch around. I, I like what I've got and I make it work for whatever I have to play. Right. Did, when you were studying uh, at Juilliard with uh, Julie Baker and all, wait, what what was the instrument you were playing at that time? Do you, do you remember? Well, um, yeah, um, sure. I, when I was a student uh, here at Juilliard, this was in the 70s, and uh, I played on a Haynes. A Haynes was my first good flute, which I bought uh, uh, with money I earned delivering newspapers. Um, and then a new company was started in the 70s, the late 70s, 
called Brannon, Brannon, the Brannon Brothers. Cooper. Yeah, right. And I, I got one of those. I have number 70, uh, Brannon. Uh, and so I used that for uh, several years. Uh, when I got to Cleveland, uh, was right about when um, Julie was retiring from the Philharmonic, and he had fl uh, Powell 2050, which was um, a flute that he'd used for many years, and uh, which was a, a design basis for some of the Yamaha instruments. They'd used that flute, and uh, Julie gave that to me. That that was really um, my flute for 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 years. I, I used that. And you played that in Cleveland. I a played lot. that in Cleveland, uh -huh. and um, and then I got together with Yamaha, and uh, we worked out. Um, well, actually, I started using the Yamaha, and then I realized uh, Cleveland was uh, the pitch level was 440, as it is in Philadelphia, and um, that's a little on the rare side now. Many orchestras are played sharper than that. 442, yeah, sure. Uh, and I found that the sharper flutes were not working well for me. Um, I had to pull out too much. And I think this is a, a problem um, with many flutists today. This is like a whole technical thing. I don't know if we want to get no, no, too I, deep into this. No, absolutely. That's for our, our listeners, our woodwind players. They want to know this stuff. Well, for flute players, um, I think you know the technical level has has exploded i mean the, people's technical abilities but in many respects people today don't play the instruments as well as they used to yeah. because they don't learn to support in a way that people used to have to learn and is that because of the efficiency of the new instruments um not so much the efficiency but because the manufacturers push sharper flutes 442 444 uh, what that means is that young students don't learn how to support to play in tune. They, they play very relaxed when they're playing soft with no support. So that when they play loud, it just goes sharp and they don't know how to deal with that short of pulling the head joint out. Whereas those of us who learn to support a lot in order to play in tune when you're playing soft, you relax the support, you can bring the pitch down, so you don't have to be adjusting the head joint. And is it also perhaps the, the, the uh, head joint design, the, the mouth hole design, the way it's undercut or not? The older flutes tend to not be as undercut as the modern head joints yeah, are. No, I, it's not the head joint, really. It's, it's the, the, the scale. The scale itself. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, so I, I, my feeling is that the, the, the flute makers do a disservice to flutists by in encouraging them to buy sharper flutes they typically say well you can just pull out but it doesn't work that way because if you pull out too much the flute is out of tune with itself, itself right right and you don't learn i've i've meet so many young flutists who at festivals and in master classes and the piano is often tuned to 440 and the flutists are playing a 442 flute pushed in all the way Whoa. which is just it's not, not good. They're not learning how to play the instrument correctly. Uh, because for me to play on a 442 flute with a 440 piano, I have to pull out so much that the instrument is just, you're battling its own its, its scale. Own scale. Right. It and, you know, years ago, I, uh, when Jimmy Galway's solo career really took off in the 70s, I understood that eventually, maybe by the 80s, he, had, he would carry four flutes with him, 440, 442, 44, and 46, depending on what continent he was going to and what orchestra yeah. he'd play with, uh, rather than minimize it to, let's say, two flutes and try to adjust yeah. that way. He, he actually carried four distinct flutes at four distinct uh, pitch centers. Yeah. Well, I found uh, in my experience with my flute, because I play with, on, on the 440 scale pulled out, I can push in and negotiate 442, 444 without a problem. I've played with colleagues from uh, Vienna and Berlin, and it's never been that great an issue for me to play pushed in. Huh. So I have the leeway there. And right. that's the way the flute is designed, is to give you some leeway. Uh, right. and. Uh, the students just don't learn how to do that anymore. Right. When you get these young flute players at any of the three schools you currently teach at, Juilliard, Curtis, or the Lynn Conservatory, um, what is 
uh, what are some of the methods, the uh, etude book scale stuff and repertoire that you, you feel are most essential and most helpful in developing uh, someone's musical personality and flutistic ability? Well, it, you know, it's, it's simple, really. Um, when one has a flute in one's hands, the most important thing to do is exercises. Um, you have to develop the ability to play whatever you imagine. So music, you don't need a flute to practice. You practice, practice music up here. Um, so, uh, I mean, for my students, there's a, a regimen of exercises, daily exercises that I insist uh, they learn. Um, ultimately, I don't, I don't care what exercises students play, provided the exercises cover the, the, um, the, the principles of technique that I... Right. Do, you, do you write them out yourself, um, they're, that they're yeah. yours that you've developed, or are they stuff from Taffanel Gobert, or... No, well, you know. well <laughs> it, it's, it's actually not even that complicated. It's a long tone exercise, which is based loosely on what um, Baker called his high tone exercise. Um, and I ask this universally of students, what long tone exercise do you do? And they will always, virtually always, um, Moïse. do the Moïse de la Sonorité right. exercise. Right. But this is a tone exercise, it's not a long tone exercise. Right. So for me it's inadequate, it doesn't cover what a long tone exercise should do, which is working on your capacity and uh, your support, your control, your vibrato, your finger technique. I mean, there's so many things that should be covered in a right. long tone exercise. Right. But they should be long, so they're challenging for the breath in order for you to build the capacity. Right, right. And do you ever use, like, uh, like I know in the Trevor Y a series of books and so forth, he uses certain excerpts, like uh, Afternoon of a Fawn or something like that, to stretch the breathing capacity. It, as part of the warm-up, I mean, do you ever use actual excerpts themselves for those uh, um, tone exercises? Well, for tone exercises, no. no. Okay. I, I don't. I, um, <laughs> I think it's dangerous to, um, to make uh, musical excerpts into exercises. We, we want to try to keep these things separate. So that doesn't transfer over as just no. a... Uh, and, you know, so that if, if yeah. you we have a technical problem in an excerpt, you don't want to get freaked out about that technical problem in that excerpt. If you have a breathing issue, you want to work on an exercise that's going to give you breathing so that you can then do after of a fawn in one breath, right. rather than thinking, oh my God, I got to do this in one breath. Right. I see what you're saying. After of a fawn, for me... Look, when you're performing it, you take a breath. I don't care. I mean, it's just like when you're speaking. Are you counting the breaths that I'm taking when I'm speaking a sentence? Of course not. We don't do right. that. Unless I put a breath where it doesn't make sense, like right. in the middle of a word right. Right. or in a way that it's right. going to ruin the meaning of my sentence. Music is exactly the same. The first phrase of Ephraim of Afon is a phrase, a sentence. If you breathe in it, okay. But, of course, at an audition, well, <laughs> it's something different. You know, you're, you're, right. you're trying to put yourself different from everyone else. And if nine people do it with no breath and you do it with a breath, right. well, are you going to do everything else so much better than they are that they're going to not notice that you, you have to, it, 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 right. taking an audition is not the same as actually playing. So. Which brings to my uh, question, a number of schools, many of the schools, uh, and specifically the, the better conservatories, now have orchestral training programs in which young players uh, typically today are really focused on uh, working on their excerpts so they can win the audition. Uh, this 40 years ago was not so much the case. You didn't have necessarily orchestral training programs to win the audition. You, had, you were majoring in an instrument in order to become a, a complete artist whether it be as a soloist, chamber musician, or orchestral player. But today, the, some of the schools are very, very focused on uh, making sure the students have a good shot at getting in the audition and winning it. And it, but let's face it, with fewer jobs, it, it really, you know, I can sort of, you can understand it from the, 
university position, perhaps, in order to make sure their students have success. But what are your feelings about that, and how does that influence your, your teaching? Well, you know, um, I do not consider it my responsibility to turn out students who are going to get jobs. My responsibility is to help a student learn how to learn so that they can continue to develop and love what they're doing. And should that translate into getting a job, that's wonderful. But you don't, in music, you don't go to school in order to get a job. You get a school in or you go to a school in order to learn how to do something you love to do. But I mean, I and couldn't agree with you anymore. But I think today, at least my perception of it, that's sort of an old school approach, which I, I think is yes, it's what it should be. But do you find s students saying, "Well, I, I you know I want to win the job"? Do you get those students oh, well, of when, when they come in and saying, "Well, how am I going to win the job?" Yes, of course, and, and uh, as I felt myself, all students want to get that job, and they should. Um, but I think the institution has to also, you know, give, have the sort of a, philosophy. A broader range. I mean, there is no way that every music student studying flute that graduates in any given year, that they're all going to get a job. It, that's not the way it works. But you can't look at not getting a job as a failure. I mean, this is something I constantly have to tell parents. A, a, a student who goes to a conservatory and ends up not going into music has not wasted those years in the conservatory. They've learned how to learn something that is so valuable that they could never learn really anywhere else. You know, musicians have to learn how to go into a room all by yourself and figure out a problem, solve a problem, accomplish a goal all by yourself. And the ability to do that isn't something that can be taught, really, and there are very few other disciplines where that's required. So the ability to do that becomes very valuable to other disciplines where a student doesn't have to go through that sort of training, like medicine or law or even business. You know, a student that has that background can be so much more successful in those other occupations, professions, uh, because they have the background that they learned, that they built uh, studying music. So, you know, devoting your life to music for years is not a waste. It's a development of your life. If you get to do it, then you're the luckiest person in the world, as I consider myself. If you don't, then you have a basis for going on to do something else in a way that none of the other students are going to have. And that will be extremely valuable to the people who are looking for students of that discipline or for professionals who are looking or institutions that are looking to hire people, you know, that have that background in addition to the, the simple book learning and, and right. stuff that's required in right. those um, yeah. occupations. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there have been so many studies done on the benefits of, uh, of working in the arts, music, uh, literature, uh, being a creative artist, painter, sculptor. I mean, it, 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 we know that, that those benefits are uh, for the entire being, that the, the one benefits in so many ways. Uh, and yet we find uh, throughout much of the country and much of the public schools that uh, funding for the arts is among the first things that gets cut along with phys ed. Mm -hmm. uh, astonishing in today's world that we're still having to uh, defend and come to grips with that. Uh, but it, it is what it is. Um, I'm going to relate a story to you uh, that Julie Baker told me once. Uh, about 35 years ago, we were uh, both at a wedding uh, of a friend of mine, and he had been friends with the, uh, this friend of mine's father. So. He was invited to the wedding, and, and fortunately for me, he was seated at my table, literally right next to me. So here I have a chance to talk to Julie for four hours during the wedding. 
And one of the questions I asked him, because at this time in the early 80s, uh, Galway's career was in you know, full bloom, and the Cooper scale was the rage, and, and flute playing was changing dramatically from the era of the, ha the typical old Haynes and Powell flutes and the Kincaid influence and, and so forth. Things were changing, no question. So I, I asked them, Mr. Baker, can you tell me what's the difference today between uh, the young flute players that you are teaching today and when you were growing up? And you know, Julie was not someone with, that you expected a professorial answer from. <laughs> you know, he was sort of a regular plain guy, a guy you could see as a farmer. I mean, he was, and he blew me away. And he turned to me and with, and with great seriousness said, when I was growing up as a young player, I learned from the conductors. I learned from Reiner and Radzinski and Metropolis and Zell and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, Stokowski and, and, you know, who's who of the great conductors of the world. He said, today, maybe there are five conductors in the whole world you could learn from. And so I was pretty taken aback. I, I, I didn't have anything to say, and I just nodded my head, you know, dutifully. But the more I've thought about that over the years, I thought it was really um, quite a deep and, an, uh, and a profound statement that he made. So with all the conductors you've encountered now in, your, in the various orchestras that you've been in and the performances, um, are there specific conductors that you can say immediately had a profound influence on your style of playing? Well, you, you know, what I can say is that um, having been so fortunate as I have to play in Cleveland and Philadelphia, I've, I've been able to learn from conductors, soloists, and colleagues. Um, so in, in, as he said, I think the point is um, that you never stop learning and what you learn at school or what you learn with your, your primary teacher is just such a small fraction of what you need and what you will eventually learn um, that it's it's so important to 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 have that going on. I always I, I've um, I've been so lucky um, to play in in orchestras where we've had the best uh, people from around the world coming through. You know, not just conductors, but also the soloists. Yeah. And, and of course, my colleagues. I mean, these are the, the lessons that, um, that I've learned over 35 years. Uh, and I don't know how people that don't have that sort of exposure manage to... To keep growing. To keep growing. Right. Yeah. I think it, it must be very, very difficult. This sort of piggybacks on, on a statement you made on an interview that I, I checked out on YouTube. And you, let, me, let me read it so I don't misquote you. You said, to be a great artist on an instrument, you have to play great music. And to play great music, you have to play in the orchestra. Uh, I mean, it, it, it made so much sense uh, to me. And, and, and not only uh, for your classical, Western European classical music, but even in the jazz vernacular, I think about all the great jazz soloists, the historic soloists, uh, you know, e e even from Holman Hawkins, Lester Young, uh, Charlie Parker, uh, John Coltrane, all of who had tremendous amount of big band experience, which is the jazz equivalent to the orchestra, uh, and, and became great soloists, all, renowned soloists, specifically in the smaller groups as well as in the larger group. Uh, but playing great music all the time is, is a necessity to become the full artist. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not that one cannot become a great musician, um, but it's just so much more difficult. And I, I will go one step further than that. I mean, the, the further you go back in the orchestra, the more difficult it is. Um, because the people up the front, the stringed instruments, they have the best music, you know? And then you move gradually back. <laughs> the woodwinds, you know, and even by rows, I'm convinced. Right. You know, right. <laughs> we have better music than brass players have. 
<laughs> and brass players have better music than percussion, percussion players. players. <laughs> that's, that's, I hadn't thought about it so, like that incrementally. <laughs> the, the more better music you play, the easier it is to become, I think, a better musician. Not to say that it's not possible. Of course not, because there are many wonderful percussionists and brass players. Of course. And even woodwind players. <laughs> so, um, but it's more challenging, you know, when your ideals are not as high as the composers that pianists or string players get to practice on all the time. Right, right. So and, those and, us, and their chamber music as well. And, well, the, the chamber music, but yeah, I, I mean, if you don't play an orchestra and you're a, a, a flute player, my God, you've never played Stravinsky, you've never played Mahler, you've never played Brahms unless you play, you know, a transcription. Right. Um, you've never played so much unbelievable music. Pro Prokofiev, all the Russian Shostakovich. Yeah, yeah it's unbelievable. It I, I it's, can't it's, imagine it's a life in music not yeah. getting to play yeah. that right. sort uh, of stuff. Sure. What, what are your favorite works uh, to perform within the orchestra th throughout your career that have given you the most if you can say the most satisfaction or that at least that you look forward to when you see it programmed up in front of you for the next season. Well, I would, I would like to say my favorite works are always the ones that, that I'm playing right at that <laughs> moment. I, I would like to say that. Uh, sometimes those are my least favorite works. But, um, you know, in all things being equal in my life now, the circumstances can completely change how I feel about a piece. Uh, who's conducting, you right. know, where we do it. I mean, actually, primarily that's the, the big thing, who's conducting. I mean, there's some repertoire that I hope never to have to play again, um, unless so-and-so is conducting, in which case, yeah, that'll be fun. Right. You know, uh, I, I have to say I feel so lucky at this point in my career to have a music director that I love playing with. Yeah, and as does um, everyone. The Met people say the same thing I, about Yannick. Uh, he's, he's extraordinary. Yeah. And the, even the repertoire that in the past I've hoped never to have to play again, I enjoy doing with him. Right. It's, it's, it seems fresh and new. Right. You know, and he has such energy. He gives so much energy to the orchestra that you can't help but be swept into it, swept along with it. It's and, amazing, isn't it, when, uh, when a conductor comes uh, totally invested uh, any particular night in, in a performance, how it transmits to the rest of the players. That's the most important thing that we can get from a conductor, is, you know, that's just the interest in actually doing what we're doing. Yes, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, it's true. I, I mean, so much of my career has been involved in Broadway shows and, you know, doing the same thing night after night after night can, um, for anyone, is it difficult? Sure, but I, yeah. uh, but I have had this fortunate experience in the last few years to be with someone who every night brings a hundred percent to the podium, mm -hmm. with a with a smile. Yeah, and it makes such a difference. Yeah, uh, it's what uh, what you've recorded extensively. You have seven solo albums, as far as I can determine now, uh, all devoted to various uh, types of uh, music: American music, French music, German music, Czech. Romantic music. Uh, there's a Brahms uh, Schumann album. Um, what are what are your favorite pieces to, to perform? Well, if, um, if, if you have you know a handful that you really well, you mentioned the the Brahms uh, Schumann album. I mean that was very important to me because uh, as we were talking about earlier, flute players who don't play an orchestra have no idea what it's like to play Brahms. But the clarinet sonatas, I think, work beautifully on the flute. So I did my own transcription of those uh, so that flute players could experience playing Brahms. Uh, and on that is also Schumann romances, not only the Robert Schumann romances, but the Clara Schumann uh, romances, yes. which are violin pieces. Yes. And they work beautifully on the flute. And it's just so important, I think, for flute players to be exposed to be able to experience this sort of repertoire. Um, other albums, you know, the, the, these are often projects um, of repertoire mostly that is just fun for me. Uh, they, um, I typically, you know, had some sort of a theme 
in order to put together a program. Right. Uh, and virtually all of these were put together for a reason other than recording. They were, you know, for a recital series or something like that. Um, and then morphed into the recording. And then it just, well, we've got all yeah. of this stuff. We might as well just record it. Right. So, yeah, uh, American music, French music, German music, Czech music, um, British music. Right. That was a very interesting yeah. um, project because I did not know British music. And Lincoln Center was doing a festival of, of British music, and they asked me if I would do a recital. So I thought for a minute and I said, God, is there enough British music for a recital? Right. Well, of course there is. Only British people knew about it, not <laughs> right. Americans. So right. I explored that a little bit and found some great repertoire yeah. uh, which is not played enough here so we did that and then uh, look we've got this down we might as well record it right interesting um just a few more questions that i had uh are there still after all these many years playing principal flute are there still solos in let's say standard repertoire that uh you know you really no, you're going when you see it programmed. You're going to have to work on that. It never. It, it, it's one of those things you can never just say, oh, "I got it together." I, I, you've got to go at it again. <laughs> well, yes, of course. <laughs> what are they? <laughs> uh, well, um, you know, if I have to play Carnival of the Animals, um, then I'm going to start practicing my double tonguing. And you, you're not going to listen to Julie's recording with Castellanos of that. <laughs> That's you know, something else. It's something else. That's the standard by which we all uh, judge ourselves, and <laughs> we seldom yes. can meet that yeah, standard. That's spectacular. Uh, a, a classic. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't need um, to interrupt, but it just. No, I had heard I, it the other I, day, so it's, it's still fresh. It's unbelievable. In my mind. I mean, and, yeah. and still now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, again, for for me, the most important thing is being in shape all the time. Um, so there is not much music that I, uh, orchestra music that I spend time with practicing because I played so much of it. Um, but, you're, just, but, but you're constant practicing every day as a daily. I do my exercise regimen every day, just like brushing teeth. I mean, it's just something that I do. Right. And that's something that I learned. Uh, from Baker, not because he told me, but because that's what he did himself. And I know that because, you know, we were at a festival when uh, uh, he was in his 80s and we were both teaching at a festival and um, my room was close to his and he would wake up in the morning and do Taffet and Gobert number one. And I'm thinking, man, if this guy's in his 80s and he's still practicing you know, Taffet and Gobert. In the Baker biography that was put out, after he passed, uh, I think there's a quote from Mitch Miller, who was a classmate of his up in Eastman, and he said, no one had to set the alarm in the Eastman dorms. Baker woke everybody up at 7 a.m. with his practicing every morning. They, everyone knew, no matter if you went out the night before, it's all right, 7 a.m., we're gonna be up. He was practicing. Well, I think that's one of the things that I yeah. inherited from him. And he is one of those uh, rare players who at the very end of his career, in the orchestra, I think, could have taken an audition and won another job. I mean, he could always play. He could play up until the end, and years after, he kept playing. Well, in those days, he was forced to retire at, at 65 because in those days there was a mandatory retirement well, no, age. No, he, uh, Kincaid, uh, was oh. forced. But oh, by, by the oh, time oh. Julie oh, I thought got Julie there, did. it was no longer oh, really? oh. Uh, mandatory. But, uh, Okay. I think he, he left when he thought this was enough. I've, he, he'd done it enough. I see. Um, uh, and he didn't have to. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't okay. one of those things where, oh, okay, now it's time. That, that, that was not the situation right. with him. Yeah, well, he was clearly one of those players totally in love with the instrument and playing. Um, it was so natural for him. It, looked, it always looked and sounded effortless. And those are sort of the, the, some of the principles that I was referring to at the beginning when we start, started talking about the philosophy of playing. He made everything sound easy, as opposed to uh, you know, another school of playing, which 
made everything sound so difficult, you know? And, and it was astonishing how good it was because it was so difficult. <laughs> Julie made it sound, oh, it made it just made it sound so easy that yeah. for me, I mean, they're, they were both so impressive, those two styles, but I mean, because yeah. it was so easy was for me like better. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, look, I, I never studied with him. Um, what, uh, you know, I, I knew him and uh, certainly at, up at Juilliard, I would run into him and whatnot. And he was always very gracious and, and uh, you're the sax player playing flute, right? You, you know, and I was studying with Tom Knife. Oh, yeah, you're studying. You know, and he said, well, come over to the house one day and all that. And of course, I was petrified. I said, oh, no, I know he's going to, uh, you know, I'm not at that level. I can't play for Julie. Uh, I should have, but I was, I was intimidated because he was one of those, you know, larger mm -hmm. than life figures. He was like God. I mean, really, for flute players uh, in New York, he was he was it for flute players around the world. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it was it was a wonderful experience uh, watching him play all those many years in the Philharmonic as a native New Yorker. Uh, it was something. Um, what are you looking forward to now? Uh, do you have any projects yourself coming up, chamber music wise or recording wise, uh, in addition to the orchestra? Um. You know, I um, <laughs> specific projects uh, right now. I mean, I'm not. I'm so busy uh, teaching uh, and, and playing in the orchestra. Um, over the past several years, I've done so many world premieres of concertos uh, that I'm just kind of resting now. <laughs> um, it's been fantastic, uh, you know, premiering concertos but it's a huge amount of work and effort and um so i i'm i'm kind of enjoying not having to worry and, about something that's and, on the horizon and your idea of rest is you're still teaching at three conservatories you know uh juilliard and, and uh, curtis every week and every other week at down in Boca Raton at the Lynn Conservatory. Yeah. You have the full <laughs> schedule with, with uh, Philadelphia coming up. Uh, you're still involved with chamber music. Uh, yeah, with, I, you, actually, I don't do much chamber music. I just don't have the time. Okay. Um, um, you know, I, I, I've realized that I will go several weeks without a day off, but I'm always in a different place. So when I go back to Philadelphia, I've been away. It feels like I've been on a vacation, so to speak. But, you know, I, I love what I do. So it's not like it's a hardship to right. go and do it. Right. Um, if it did feel like a hardship, I wouldn't do it. If I didn't right. enjoy the teaching, I wouldn't do it. Right. Um, and I don't feel that I need to have a day off in order to do nothing. Uh, so, right. Uh, but I, I think it is important to uh, that it's in different places for me because then it feels like I've been away. It's not monotonous. It's not right. monotonous. Right. Great. Well, uh, before we break, I just well, I want to say two things. One, you're going to be the guest artist uh, in March of 2019, March 17th, which is a Sunday here, uh, uh, the New York Flute Club at their annual uh, flute fair. Yeah. And we hope uh, all of those of you who are watching this video who are in the Northeast will make your way to New York on Sunday, March 17th. I think it's a full day from 8.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. at night. Uh, Jeffrey will be playing a recital, and I usually the artist also gives a master class of some mm -hmm. sort. Um, and that would be important. And also to check out the Philadelphia Orchestra, whether in Philadelphia or as when they travel. Uh, it's really been one of the greatest orchestras in our country for the entire 20th century and now the 21st century and with one of the great uh, conductors in the world, Yannick Negatsugun, and with Jeffrey K. Negatsugun. Negatsugun. <laughs> Thank you. Of course, I, I'm, I'm talking about a, a, a French-Canadian conductor to a French-Canadian. Yeah, well, <laughs> English-Canadian. English -Canadian. <laughs> from Montreal. Well, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but, Jeff, thanks so much for, for doing this today and for sharing your experiences and knowledge with our listeners, and we hope... All of you will uh, also look for Jeffrey's recordings, uh, which will show on the uh, uh, after credits here, and uh, we'll certainly sample some of those. They're really wonderful. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time on the Woodwind Legacy Series. <laughs>